Hello and welcome to the Majlis, the weekly podcast by Ready for Europe, Radio Liberty, focusing on Central Asia. I am Mohammed Tahir, Ready for Europe, Radio Liberty's media manager for South and Central Asia here in Washington, D.C. In Kazakhstan, an activist called Serikjan Bilash is on trial and for the right reason, his trial is making lots of headlines. Bilash is running a campaign to expose what he calls Chinese aggression against ethnic Turkic minorities in Xinjiang province of China. What's the latest in his trial and where is the this headed and the bigger question is why is Kazakhstan doing this and why now and what does Bilash's story tell us about China's growing influence in the country to discuss all these I'm joined by Joanna Lillis chief central Asia correspondent for Eurasia net joining us from Almaty Jean Bunin freelance journalist with focus on ethnic affairs in Xinjiang province of China also joining us from Kazakhstan and Bruce Panier editor of Radio Free Europe Radio Liberty central Asia blog Kishlok Owazi is with us from Prague thank you for making the time for this discussion colleagues hi thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah. let's start with you Joanna I I guess Bilash's trial uh, continues. So what's the what's the latest about the process? Well, his trial continues, but it, it seems to be on, on, on a bit of a hold. Uh, the trial began on Monday in Nur Sultan, Kazakhstan's capital, where Serik Jan Bilash was taken after his arrest in Almaty in March. And a lot of questions were raised at the time if his alleged crimes were committed in Almaty, where he's based and conducted his activism over the, the detainees in the Xinjiang camps. Um, why was he he taken a thousand kilometers to the north to uh, to be held under house arrest, which is what has happened to him in the intervening period, and to stand trial. On Monday, when his trial finally began on charges of incitement, his lawyer petitioned to have the trial moved to Almaty, and the judge, unexpectedly for some adver- observers, agreed with the petition, allowed the trial to be moved. Serik Shan is now to be held under house arrest in Almaty, and his trial will take place in Almaty, but in the meantime, of course, the trial has now gone into some sort of hiatus uh, while he's moved down and it enters the Almaty court system. What's the significance, uh, Joanna, as far as you can understand, of having this trial in Nur Sultan or or in Almaty? And what difference does that Well, make? I mean, uh, given that it was very irregular to, to remove Serik Shambilash to, to Nur Sultan, when there was there didn't seem to be any grounds for that since, the as I said, the alleged crime was supposedly, um, which he denies, by the way, was supposedly um, carried out in Almaty and he lived in Almaty. Um, so it was considered highly irregular. Um, why it should be uh, now moved back to Almaty is, is a matter of, of speculation. That seems to be a measure of leniency that was unexpected. Um, also, given that many of Serik Jambalash's supporters are in, mm. Al- mm. in Almaty, um, that creates more grounds perhaps for protest because we're seeing them even in, in Nur okay. Sultan um, so far away. Um, so I, I wonder if the authorities are trying to show that they are being reasonable that, that he will get a fair trial. That's mm-hmm. what I can speculate about this move back to Almaty. Mm-hmm. Okay, Jean, um, let's talk about the alleged crime. Uh, so what are those the allegations against him and what, what do you make of that? I mean, as I understand the allegations were, I guess, what, there was 174, Article 174, inciting ethnic hatred, I think. Uh, and it was for what? It was for a in, speech in... that he made in, uh, in February. Uh-huh. I think it was mostly an Uyghur or... I forget exactly. It was not mostly a Kazakh audience, if I remember correctly. And he, basically, he was. I mean, he's when he speaks, it's a double-edged sword for him because he's a very, he's a very bright, uh, he's a very talented orator. But then when he, uh, when he speaks, he kind of, he tends to get carried away, and so he doesn't, he doesn't always think about the political, I guess, ramifications of what he says. So, so what, um, what did he, he really, was saying? What, yeah, what did he, he said, say? I mean, yeah. I mean, he basically said. I mean, he had a long speech, and then at one point he said something like, "This is a jihad against the soulless Chinese," but then. He he added something along the lines of, but this is not jihad in the sense of taking up a gun and, you know, going to Syria or something like that. It's, this is an informational war. And, uh, but, the, you know, that second part basically, as I understand, was completely cut from the state media that reported on this. And he was basically presented as having said only that first part. And so the allegations are that. Uh, what I make of it, I mean, personally, knowing him, I wouldn't say I'm very close friends, but still as somebody I've worked with now fairly frequently on and off uh, for about a year. 
And no, it's definitely, there is no extremism, there is no radical jihadism, there's nothing like that about him or about anything he's really done, I would say. Mm. I mean, what he's done has been, in my personal opinion, just very heroic. It's been work that's, you know, it's been work done to expose what's happening in Xinjiang, and uh, he's probably, the group, Atajurt, has probably done, I would say, probably the most, as far as this kind of testimonial-based evidence goes, the most, more than any other group in the world to Mm. expose what's been happening there. So, So for me, it's, it's... it's the, the allegations that are, definitely don't match what he's done and what he's mm. contributed. No. Since you work with him, uh, Gene, was he expecting something like this to happen to him? Uh, I think he was. I mean, it was uh, it was kind of on and off. So if I go back to, I think I remember it was after Sarah Gulsaud Bai's trial mm. that this was really reaching a peak. This is when Atashirt was becoming very much more popular, much more visible. Mm. And I remember him telling me that at that time that, you know, this is basically a year ago, almost exactly, he was saying that, you know, the authorities had been warning him. All of his relatives were being interrogated. His mm. relatives didn't understand Sarah John and kind of, they didn't understand why he kept going with this, even though, you know, he was getting so much government pressure he was saying and you know i mean i don't want to cite this as fact but he told me that you know some of the authorities had said like if we want to find heroin in your car we can find heroin in your car mm, if we want mm. to they were saying things like that and then but then this kind of went down and then it seemed like there was some sort of cooperation reached uh, between autojurt and the authorities for some time and it was really it didn't seem like it was uh, they were as much under threat then and this went so maybe all the way through the new year and then I guess it was at the beginning of the year that this started moving and then you had this open letter by all of these uh, different intellectuals all of these uh, I guess um, the intellectual elite uh, that uh, surfaced at the end of January and that kind of then there was the trial against Dr. Short being unregistered they were fined that was in February and then in March suddenly at the beginning of March you had this arrest mm. so, so it's this, um, you, you mentioned this letter what, what that open letter was about? I believe that open letter, I mean, it was in Kazakh, unfortunately. My Kazakh is not very good, and I didn't read it. But as I understand from what I remember, it was something like 14 or 17 maybe mm-hmm. signatories who were kind of leading. There were political analysts. There were, uh, I think, uh, Mukhtar, I forget his name, Melka uh, I guess Joanna can remember it. Shahanov, sorry, uh, Mukhtar, Mukhtar Shahanov, and then uh, he, I guess he was the head, he was the titular uh, uh, signatory of the letter, and then there were a lot of, you know, there was also Abzal Kuspan, who was uh, the lawyer for Sarah Gulen, who had worked together with Atajur, but then there was a falling out, so it was a lot of, kind of these kind of people, and uh, the letter, I think, basically accused Atajur of creating disorder, harming relations, but again, I, 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 I'm not the best person to ask for the exact content, because I didn't read it in detail, mm-hmm. but it was basically accusing Atajur of something like creating disorder or something, creating relations, ethnic tensions, and then that later led to, I guess, Mm. it was a sort of prelude, you know, to what happened after. Okay, let's uh, go a little bit into the context of this, Bruce. Uh, You know, we did not reach to this point uh, in one day, so there is a backstory behind this. Put this a little bit in the the context of why we are here and how we are here. Kazakh authorities have been concerned uh, about this issue being raised in Kazakhstan, and it really gained a lot of traction uh, Mm. over the last year and a half or something, where they were bringing up the problems of, of, you know, what's happening in China. And when it was the Uyghurs, there was a little bit of distance. But once Mm. people started talking about the Oroman, the ethnic Kazakhs who had returned, Mm. had been invited to return to Kazakhstan and take citizenship, even though they weren't born there. And, and, you know, many, many people did. uh, Kazakhs from Mongolia, from Uzbekistan, and and from China. And and, uh, when the the, some of the Kazakhs from China started going back to China. They were already in Kazakhstan and registered, and they went back and, uh, you know, either to wrap up loose ends that they had, visit relatives. Some of them had businesses over there, mm-hmm. and, and it became apparent that, that there were among them some that d- weren't returning, and, and mm-hmm. their relatives back in Kazakhstan were unsure exactly what happened to them, so people started looking into it, found out that they'd been detained and put in these camps, uh, and, and it became a, a serious issue in Kazakhstan. Now, the Kazakh government, of course, has a is trying to do some kind of balancing act here. China's a, yeah. a big neighbor, both in terms of size, but also in terms of trade, investment. And so the Kazakh authorities were reluctant to really push this. And there were a lot of people in Kazakhstan that felt that they should be pushing it, mm. especially since it involved ethnic Kazakhs and some ethnic Kazakhs who either had Kazakh citizenship by this time or were on, on the way, on the path to getting Kazakh citizenship. Uh, and so the Kazakh government has made some very 
lukewarm statements about, you know, some concern about what's going on, but they certainly haven't gone after the Chinese uh, to try to find out more about this, let alone condemn the campaign that's going on in Xinjiang at the moment. Um, so groups like Atajurt uh, and there's others out there are not necessarily well received uh, in Nur Sultan these days. They, they would rather that they were quiet about this. Whereas on the other hand, it seems to echo fairly loudly among some segments of the population in Kazakhstan yeah. who feel that the, that the Kazakh government should be speaking out on this and should be trying to find out what happens to Kazakhs from Kazakhstan who go over there and go missing and should condemn the you know these re-education camps that have been going on uh, that they've opened up in Xinjiang too you know I mean it's it's kind of worth noting that when Bilash was detained it was about a week before Nur Sultan Nazarbayev resigned as president after all this time and, and mm. so you, you kind of wonder if maybe they weren't trying to wrap up one loose end uh, before they transferred power so that it might not be so much of a problem for the successor it hasn't turned out that way certainly and it's also worth mentioning that that Atajurt is only one of of several groups that are campaigning for yeah. ethnic Kazakhs in Xinjiang, you have to consider that possibly there's some competition among them and that there might be one of these groups or two of these groups who are not sorry to see Bilash detained and put on trial uh, because it opens up new possibilities for them, for publicity, advance their own groups, cause. Yeah. But who are, I'm sorry, I'm sorry if I can interrupt. Who are the other groups, if I may ask? You know, I'm trying to remember the names of them. <laughs> so, uh, but the, I knew that there was one. One was uh, I guess there are at least two. A friend of yeah. Bilash. Yeah. I mean, that was, I mean right, right. That was Kudera Lioras. But I mean, I wouldn't say that they're. They, I mean, they have not been very active at all in the past months. So, I mean, if this was a chance for them to do something, they haven't done anything. And it's. Uh, I mean, I don't. I don't know. It just for me it doesn't really fit that that much. But again, okay. uh, Gene, it raises question. Like, let me put Bruce's word in in my word. Uh, like. It, Bilash is in trouble, but there are at least one or two uh, organizations that their activities are also focused on Xinjiang-related issues, but they are doing their work, but Bilash is in trouble. Why is that? If I could just interject, the, the main organization that now exists, given that Bilash's group has been liquidated effectively, mm. was set up in response to this liquidation and run mm. by a former associate of his. Mm. Um, but it's, you know, it's very much believed in, in circles in Kazakhstan that this has been done with the instigation of the government, so it won't be active, not like uh, Atujurt was. And indeed, we're not seeing it, it, it being very active. So mm. it's, it's a sort of divide and rule tactic, if you like, by the government, arrest Bilash close down the group and then create some kind of sort of astroturf movement that the government can control. That's the scenario I hear from people in Kazakhstan um, as be, be, being sort of likely. And we're certainly seeing that since the arrest of Bilash and the and the end of Atajurt, if you like, the whole issue has, has almost died out in Kazakhstan. And, and, you know, you can see that that's very much in the interest of China. It's very much in the interest of the Kazakh government. Um, and those are the two, um, you know, the two interested players if you like, in, in having some silence on the issue, mm. given that almost all international media reporting at one time was coming out of Almaty, where former detainees were provided, journalists were provided with access to former detainees and relatives of detainees by Atajurt and Serik Jambelash. You know, I, you mean, want... I would, if I may add, I mean, I don't know if it's, say, it's fair to say that it's the end of Atajurt. Yeah, that's, because, that's I mean, my I mean, question. They're still, they're still working. It's maybe in 10% of the capacity that they were working in maybe in December or January when it was really at the peak, but I mean, people are still coming, you know, the office is still open, and I mean, I mean, they're still doing in some ways more than all of these other groups that compete with them are doing, even at 10% of what they were before. But there has to be an implication of uh, his detention, I mean, t- to the organization, so where does his arrest put the organization in case if he's arrested? It's definitely, it's a big hit to the organization because, uh, I mean, they can keep going. The problem is that they don't have the leadership. I mean, it was a very sort of vertical uh, leadership with him because there was not a lot of people who could replace him. There's not a lot of people. Right now, I mean, one of the problems that they always talk about is now just money. I mean, they don't, they can't really fundraise because a lot of people have been scared. A lot of the testifiers that before would come in and testify, they are now scared to do so. Testifiers would come in from other cities that Atajurt would, you know, pay for, you know, they would pay their transport to come in because a lot of these families, people are quite from not, 
you know, well-off families. So like for them to come from, say, Tal Dikargan to Almaty and, you know, do an interview, it's, 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 it's resources. So Atajurt would pay for this and they would make it possible. Now, Sarek Jan was kind of the driving force and he would be able to, with his speeches, with his, all of this activity, he was able to fundraise. And now that he's not there, I mean, all of the kind of that spirit, that uh, drive has been really taken away and that nobody's really filled the gap that he, uh, he's left. So this is probably the biggest problem. And it's, it's probably exactly what, you know, China would want, I would imagine, in this case. Because it's, mm. it's definitely, yeah, it's, it's definitely harmed the organization that way. Mm. I was watching the, the clip. I think it was after or before the trial. You know, there were lots of people uh, gathered in support of him. I'm talking about the recent video clip uh, that came out from Kazakhstan about his trial. Talking about the reaction of people for what's going on, talking about the, his or his organization's support base, how big is that? What kind of reactions we have been getting so far from people about this trial? I mean, uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, this is an interesting question. I mean, his support base is broadly limited um, to the people affected by the issue. Now, we know they are they're fairly large in numbers. I mm. mean, obviously, there's a million people believed at least in, to be in camps in Xinjiang. Um, mm. Quite a small percentage of them are Kazakhs, and not all of them have a voice in Almaty who, to, to support Sadek Jambalash. You know, many are not in Almaty in Kazakhstan. So, um, you know, the, the number of his support, we can't put a figure on it, mm. um, but what we can say is it, it's most Mostly the people who are, you know, who have have relatives in camps or who have been detained themselves in camps, or at the very most who are war romans. Those are people who are, are Kazakh uh, ethnic Kazakhs who have moved to Kazakhstan and who are from China. But beyond that, you know, there there isn't much reach. I mean, at, at the, before Jean talked about the letter in which basically Sarek Jambalash was denounced by prominent Kazakh intellectuals and community leaders. Now, before that, they had been speaking out about this issue and expressing concern about the position of Kazakhs in camps. Mm. But they are clearly very much against Bilash, as they expa- explained mm. in their letter, um, believing that he was driving a wedge between Woromans and Kazakh-born Kazakhs, and that his work, you know, in their view, wasn't what should be done. Um, privately, I've heard from some of them that um, they believe that a distinction should be made between Kazakhs and Uyghurs in order to try and help Kazakhs. Now that, of course, it doesn't show any great solidarity, but it may explain why they're trying to diffuse the situation. And also, another reason that they may not support Bilash is that they, they are being pressured themselves by the authorities in Kazakhstan in order to appease China. Mm-hmm. But what I'm trying to say is, when it comes to Sarek Jambalash's support base, we saw maybe a few dozen people outside and inside the court in um, Nur Sultan on Monday chanting um, freedom and protesting over his case but that's not a large number of people and what we're not seeing is it spreading beyond the base, especially because Kazakhstan's own Kazakh community leaders do not support Sarek Jambalash, so you know there isn't any great potential for this support Mm. to spread beyond the base of people uh, concerned by the camps Okay, um, so obviously the you know the way China is treating ethnic minorities in Xinjiang, including the ethnic Kazakhs, are a sensitive uh, topic in Kazakhstan, and authorities are expected to respond, I believe, yeah, at least by the people. But this guy is doing, so to say, the God's work rather successfully. And why is Kazakhstan bothered by this? What are the motives behind what the authorities are doing, and what? are the Nur Sultana's ultimate goal behind this. Let's continue the discussion talking about these and many other questions very shortly. But before that, uh, let me recap the debate that today on the Majlis, I'm joined by John Lelis, Chief Central Asia Correspondent for Eurasia Net, Jean Bunin, freelance journalist based in Kazakhstan, Bruce Panier, editor of Radio Free Radio Liberties, Central Asia Blog, Kishlak Owazi, based in Prague. I'm Mohamed Tahir, a Radio Free Radio Liberties Media Manager for Southern Central Asia here in Washington, D.C., and we are discussing the trial of Xinjiang activist Serikjan Bilal in Kazakhstan. So I will get to main point very shortly. But before that, um, Jean, maybe we can uh, start with you again. You have done lots of work on this topic, both in Kazakhstan and in Xinjiang. The Xinjiang governor just said that most of the people in concentration camps are released 
what your reports say. I mean, that's yeah. <laughs> I think you're probably the tenth person to ask me for this, for comment on that issue. But uh, as well, I believe that it's technically true. But uh, I mean, the devil is in the details. So I mean, they started massively releasing people mm -hmm. at the end of towards the end of last year, and that's what's. I mean, again, thanks to Atajur, that was very well documented for the Cossacks at least. Mm -hmm. So I mean, we have cases of two hundred or three hundred people, documented people with names, details, etc., of who have been released. You know, either at the end of last year or at the beginning of this year and that started really at the end of last year and there's a certain wave but then if you talk to Kyrgyz if you talk to Uyghurs they were not as vocal or in reporting these cases but if you talk to them you actually heard that you know there were pe people be were being released from all the ethnic groups not just Kazakhs I, for me I'm let's say 95% sure that this was a reply to all the international pressure that came mm. it's been a drive to kind of dismantle the attention on the camps because most of the western media attention has really focused on the camps Mm -hmm. The problem, the problem in Xinjiang is that it's it's much more complicated. I mean, the whole thing is a big camp, but I mean, there's may various detention types, and I will quickly list them here. So, kind of the most common one is that people who live there are under a sort of kind of let's say town arrest, or in some cases even a house arrest. Where I mean, because everything is linked to people's ID cards, you know, you have to swipe your ID cards if you go into the bus station and you want to buy a ticket to go to this to another city, for example. You know, so a lot of people may not be able to do that without permission. So. For a lot of people, even their movements around their neighborhood, around their city, around their region, limited. And uh, they're on their con this constant scrutiny. They have to go to flag raising ceremonies. They have to attend meetings. And there's always the fear that somebody, you know, they might end up in detention if they don't do something quote unquote right but then so a lot of people who are being released they're being released into the sort of house arrest town arrest but then there's a lot of people who are getting jail sentences so there's a lot of people who were in camp for a year or two and then they were sentenced to say five years ten years fifteen years of jail and this has been a lot of especially imams so religious people have uh, have been I would say from the statistics that we have it's been about they've been twice as likely to end up in prison sentences than can other you, people can you put number on that so especially, let's especially see i can say them. that from the database that i run where we document victims mm -hmm. and we have five we have five thousand victims documented right now i can say that and they are they are like, ethnic kazakhs they're a mix uh, mm -hmm. they're ethnic kazakhs uyghurs everybody who's affected by this but about let's say I mean, let's say about 40% of them are Kazakhs in this database. So there for the Kazakhs, I mean, I can say for imams, it's about something like 23% of them are in prison of the victims with actual jail sentences. For an average victim, it's for everybody else, it's something like 13 or 12%. I mean, this is very rough numbers. I'm, I'm going off the top of my head. So people are also getting put in jail, which is a very big problem. And this is a problem that's going to have to be addressed because if people are getting put in jail, then this affects Kazakhs as well. So a lot of, like some of the people that are still coming to Atajur today, even in its very reduced form, a lot of these people are there because their relatives have been sentenced. And sometimes these are elder. I mean, this one woman who has a, her mother is, who is maybe I think over 50 over 60 she's been sentenced to 15 or 20 years and she's been moved from northern Xinjiang to Urumqi to the number two women's prison there so people like that are still coming there's still those cases there's also people being sent to factories or being given kind of given these administrative mm -hmm. positions where they basically help manage this whole system they you know they they can become teachers at maybe you know something like a center or they can become administrative clerks in these kind of local administration offices for the neighborhoods so there's all this kind of forced job placement going on as well. There's kids that are being split for their parents and being sent to orphanages. There's people who are being transferred to inner China to a sort of basically employment, quote unquote. And this is also thousands of people. So basically China is kind of dismantling the system. Okay. So uh, for that, sorry for the long-winded explanation, but basically my goal is to say that when they say that say 90% of the people, let's say, have gone out of these camps, and 90%, I'm sure, I don't, I don't take that seriously, but when they say that most of the people have gone out of these camps, it's it might be technically true in the sense that if 90% of the people who were in these facilities are no longer in this, these facilities, that doesn't mean that they're technically free or they're even mm -hmm. in a better place now. Yeah. So no, that's, it, yeah, uh, that's fact, kind of the devil. In, in fact, the governor, uh, who is also Uyghur, I believe, he was saying 90%, but I replaced 90% with, with the word most, just to be in this, on the safe side. Um, Jean, you know, you mentioned this database. It's just a huge resource. Um, Kazakhstan also, you remember, the runs the Oralman strategy or policy, whatever is that. So um, how many people, ethnic Kazakhs from China, are affected by this, in this other way, by these Chinese uh, aggression, whatever you call that, against those ethnic 
ethnic minorities. Is there any number, exact number, that you can you can share with us in terms of number of ethnic Kazakhs who are affected but, by I mean, this? But but I mean, like affected in what sense? In some sense, everybody's affected. I mean, I'm affected yeah. also. But I mean, it's uh, infected in what's in as in being detained or detained being, or put in those camps. I don't think that the policies were really discriminatory more towards Uyghurs or towards Kazakhs or towards Kyrgyz, etc. Mm. So for me, I don't think it's when they say something like that 10% figure, about 10% of the population, which was mostly done for Uyghurs. I mean, I don't think that this is, there's no reason to believe that the Kazakhs are getting somehow better treatment. And I think, I mean, I would say if you want to take the population, population of Xinjiang, the Kazakh population, which is, I guess is 1.5 million officially, and take 10% of that, then, I mean, something like 100,000 or more affected in some sort of detention, if you don't count all the people who have to live in that system, you know, and which is also a form of detention, but it's not officially recognized as a form of detention, then something, hundreds of thousands is probably not, you know, it's some, somewhere in that range, it's on that magnitude, I would say. Earlier, I and Bruce were talking about some of the bigger questions around uh, Bilash's trial. So let me get into this, Bruce, uh, with you. So all this in mind, given the fact that this is also an emotional story in Kazakhstan, if I were to be Kazakh leader, if not publicly, but under the table, I would thank uh, people like Bilash for doing what uh, he does about those people. But why the authorities are trying to arrest him? Well, you got to remember that, that anything to do with China and then pulling something over on the Kazakhs is a political powder keg. You know, we saw it with the land protests a couple of years ago, land privatization protests. So this is, um, it's a potential weapon that the opposition can use to, to seriously hurt the Kazakh government and they're okay. aware of that. So they, they don't like uh, stories getting out about how the Chinese might be taking advantage of Kazakhstan or ethnic Kazakhs in, in any way because uh, it puts them in an incredibly hard, tough position where, you know, they, they don't want to speak out because that's that could ruin any number of trade ties that they have with China. You know, not to mention, like I said, they share a long, long border with them. Mm-hmm. If you're looking from Kazakhstan across the border into China, it's overwhelming because China is huge in terms of population, land mass, everything. Uh, and so, so it's tough. Um, you know, that's why someone like Vilash could be could be a valuable ally to an opposition group because if he wants to raise this and the ineffectiveness of the Kazakh government, it, it could really hurt the credibility of the people in power in Kazakhstan right now. So they got to watch that. It's hard to spin relations with China in a very good way for Kazakhs. They've been worried about this for years and years and and when they see and hear these kind of stories about Chinese government repressing ethnic Kazakhs or you know the the rumor years ago that the Chinese were planning on coming in and buying all kinds of, of land in Kazakhstan or the Chinese workers get more paid more money when they're mm. working at the same oil sites as Kazakh workers um, you know so that's unfortunately the way it is the, the Kazakh government no one in the Kazakh government could come out openly and and speak out very firmly and strongly against what's happening in China. Um, and so while while they might approve of some people in the country bringing up the subject when they don't, uh, they understand that, like I said, it, it's a loaded issue. And it, if it does release some tension in some segment of society, it, it potentially could uh, come back and boomerang and hit the government one day. Mm-hmm. Joanna, we understand, you know, the authorities' sensitivities about the type of work uh, activists like Blash are doing in Kazakhstan, but what's Kazakhstan's own policy about those ethnic Kazakhstan? See, what they are doing about them? Well, um, the Kazakh government says it is working with Chinese officials on cases, um, but they have not provided clear and sort of transparent information on this. For example, there was a report a few months ago that uh, I think it was the end of last year that the government had secured the release of I believe two and a half thousand Kazakhs, um, not released, sorry, the um, permission for two and a half thousand Kazakhs to travel, um, to, who lived in China to travel to Kazakhstan, to move to Kazakhstan, that was the presumption. But they never said, um, these people were not thought to have been in camps and um, they never said, you know, who the people were, there was never any follow-up on whether they came, if they came, um, and on, under what conditions. And so the government has sort of obfuscated by mixing up uh, different cases, saying it's kind of uh, working on, on cases, but not specifically of Kazakhs in camps because it's quite hard for them to acknowledge even the existence of the camps when the Chinese themselves don't acknowledge that they're camps and say they're vocational training centres. Having said that, um, the government has, um, it's also tried to work on cases where Kazakhs have been in detention in China for having dual citizenship, which is illegal. It's also illegal in Kazakhstan. They should be choosing one or the other. And the, But the government says it's been working on such cases and I think they, they have tried to work behind the
behind the scenes. But in general, I mean, in some ways they've come under fire, um, including obviously prominent community leaders in Kazakhstan who are opposition minded, the ones that Bruce said um, could potentially create a problem for the government if, if uh, you know, allied with that cause. And they have come under fire in the past for not doing enough, certainly. Um, and um, they haven't publicly issued any strongly worded condemnations of China over the camps. But, of course, they're in a very difficult position. China's a mighty country, economically, politically, and Kazakhstan is obviously a minnow compared to that. So, in some ways, of course, it, uh, one can see why they are criticised for perceived lack of action uh, or criticism, at least. Um, but on the other hand, of course, one can sympathise that they have very little clout to wield with China and they have obviously as Bruce mentioned investment to protect and, and also their security interests. So on the other hand we can also note that the Kazakh government has certainly like uh, for example in Kyrgyzstan earlier this year there were um, some protests um, related yeah. to China that at which the subject of the camps was raised because our ethnic Kyrgyz people are also in the camps yeah. and um, you know after that the authorities issued actual words of support for Chinese policy. I mean President Sort of by Jane Beckoff said that people would be punished if they rabble roused and that people should be grateful to have a, a partner like China. Now, Kazakhstan has been certainly not been making such supportive statements. Kazakhstan didn't sign the letter, the recent letter at the yeah. United Nations that criticized Chinese policy, signed mostly by Western states. Neither did Kazakhstan or Kyrgyzstan come to that, sign the letter in support that was signed by mm. some Muslim countries and some Central Asian countries, Turkmenistan and Tajikistan. That was supporting Chinese policy and was signed by major Muslim countries in the world. So other than Bilash, uh, is this uh, issue, the way the ethnic Kazakhs are treated in China, is this on the agenda of any other Kazakh political party? I don't know if there is any opposition these days. Is it at all on the agenda of Kazakhs in Kazakhstan in this or the other way? It was on the agenda quite... Um, when Sadiq Jambalash was active, um, it had reached the agenda. And, um, you know, there were prominent Kazakh community leaders who mm. are known for their opposition to the government who had spoken out about this I'm talking about people like Muhtar Shakhanov, uh, Respect Sarsenbay, the people with very you know big followings whose voices carry a lot of weight and who are known to be you know very politically opposed to the government um, and they'd spoken out about this and called on the government to act, called on, on the government to do something. Mm. However as we as we discussed earlier um, they later signed a, a, signed a letter denouncing Bilash mm. and they have stopped speaking out about this. I met Muhtar Shakhanov of only a couple of weeks ago and I asked him about this and uh, he said that um, that Sadiq Jambalash had been creating problems in the Kazakh community, that he was too incendiary, that it was creating problems for Kazakh mm. and that, and he also said that people were still speaking out in support but in support of, of calling on the government to act over the camps but really what I see is that, that the, the thing has been very much silenced you don't see it in the media, we don't see these community leaders speaking out anymore and I don't know if that's because they've come under government pressure or they've simply developed a, a great rift with um, Sarah Jean Bilash and they don't want to be associated with the cause anymore. Mm. But the fact is that, of course, the Kazakhs, as Jean has explained extensively, continue to suffer greatly in Xinjiang, whether or, whether or not they're in camps. I think the way he put it, that it's one giant concentration camp, the entire region of Xin, Xinjiang mm. is quite appropriate. It's interesting to see how this issue has been shut down in, in debates in Kazakhstan, mm. which, as I say, is in China. China's interest and, and, and in the government's interest, presumably. Yeah. Let me take, Bruce, your point in this. Joanna just mentioned how this discussion uh, about the ethnic Kazakhs in, in Xinjiang are shut down. What's the ultimate goal from Kazakh authorities' point of view in doing this? Well, they want it to go away, you know, to the greatest extent possible. I mean, it just complicates their relations with China. You know, again, it leaves the government vulnerable to, to what's really some legitimate criticism. I mean, you know, you know, the whole program of the Oral Mon is come back to your homeland and live here and, you know, mm -hmm. we'll all create this great state, but apparently speak up for people who are trying to get citizenship and in this case, not even that. You know, there's this idea that maybe Nur Sultan Nazarbayev before and, and now Takayev inherited it, that they should be the spokesman for ethnic Kazakhs, you know, in, in the world. Uh, and they should be out there to help 
to help promote them, you know, and, and keep them from falling into these kind of situations like they, they're encountering in Xinjiang now. You know, it might be unrealistic, but there there seems to be some expectation that, you know, Kazakhstan is the homeland of the Kazakhs, and they're going to, you know, say something about the interest of all their ethnic kin, no matter where they are in the, are in the world. So it's disappointing to these kind of people to find out that uh, the economics uh, trump anything that, you know, the, the ethnic relationship that they would have with these people. Is that the Orulman plan strategy is dead now, at least speaking of ethnic Kazakhs in China at the moment? I would say if you're coming from China, yeah, then, y- you know, that that's probably true. Uh, yeah. I would be real curious to see how many people they're willing to take and what the steps are going to be to do that. They, they, surely they're going to be consulting with the Chinese government much more on this. The, the Orulman program won't end because there are ethnic Kazakhs in many other countries, so they'll still continue to come to Kazakhstan. Now, the number that actually show up that come from China, I would expect would be reduced in coming months and probably years. And Jean, uh, Jean, what's your insight on that? It, I don't know how to call it, not a repatriation, but the bringing ethnic Kazakhs from diaspora and help them to settle down in Kazakhstan. Is it still going on uh, when it comes to ethnic Kazakhs in China or it's halted? What's the current update about that? Oof. Like Joanna said, it's, I guess, the MFA or the government, they're not being extremely transparent about, about mm-hmm. everything. But, I mean, definitely a lot of people have not only been released, but have also come back to Kazakhstan over the past, let's say, six to seven months. And that's, I mean, we have, again, documented dozens of those cases, and that's, you know, that's the only cases that we documented, which is a very small fraction. So I wouldn't be surprised if it was 2,000 or 3,000 or whatever they said. But again, it's it's very also, it's very clear that a lot of these people are coming back, they're extremely scared. Yeah. Uh, a lot of them even don't. For example, one of the things that I've done kind of on a volunteer basis, I've teamed up with another human rights organization that's not out to but I mean, the, what's the International Legal Initiative. So they do kind of general human rights, but they've also done a lot of work with and so we've teamed up and we've taken some of these ex-detainees. So far we've taken, I think, a total of nine for medical examinations to make sure that there was nothing, you know, very systematically wrong with many of them. And, you know, there's some patterns that are a bit worrying. But in general, it's, I mean, it's not so, so bad. But, I mean, we've also tried to invite other people apart from these nine. And it's uh, often even or Alman, who ex-detainees themselves, who have tried to contact others and said, like, like guys that come in, like, there's these free medical examinations. And people are just saying, that, no, no, our health is fine. Nothing. We don't need to get anything checked up. And they're afraid to even do that. And, I mean, there's also cases of people who are coming back and they're only being given two months and this is i don't know this is basically a sort of it's a de facto hostage situation that's not really being recognized as such but basically it's people who are being told by china that they can come back here for two months see their relatives and then within two months they must return otherwise their relatives there basically get detained mm. and uh i mean i know one such woman who we also took for medical examinations she came here she stayed for two months and very obediently she went and uh, she went back to china when her time was up even though she had been held in the camp for something like you know half a year a year she, i think she had her back damaged she was i mean she was definitely mistreated there and uh, she ended up in a wheelchair at one point and she still ended up going back there and so this 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 just kind of shows kind of the level of the the fear and the, you know, the threats that the chinese side uses to make sure that for me it's again just basically keeping this information vacuum that they want to to Xinjiang to be. They want that integration vacuum as closed as possible, so they don't want lots of Kazakhs now going to Kazakhstan and staying for however they like, for however long they like, and mm-hmm. just, you know, talking freely about their experiences. So for me, it's yeah, it's, it's difficult to imagine how they're going to just keep letting people out. When you have to, you know, vet every single person and threaten them and carefully get them to agree not to talk about what they saw about their experiences it's just it's a lot of work and uh, it's obviously i think is they're going to look for an easier way to solve that and that's probably going to le- lead to the, to the general reduction of people coming over from there mm-hmm. but again a lot depends on how the situation in xinjiang will develop because okay. it's not I, w- I wouldn't say it's very stable at the moment so mm. okay i think we are already way over time just a final note bruce uh, let me end with you um so what are that you, you will be looking at going for Forward, uh, in terms of um, where the Belashi's case headed and this uh, kind of sentiment that brewing in Kazakhstan about this. Well, the Belash trial, just to see how long it drags out, I imagine mm-hmm. it's in the interest of the authorities now that they would they would just let this go on and on. If he gets convicted and sent to prison, obviously this is going to be this could be problematic for him. 
And not just like within Kazakhstan, but I mean, the outside reaction would probably be, there will be some negative reaction from outside the country Mm -hmm. to that too. In terms of what China's policy is going to be, you know, I mean, we were just talking about, you know, this this repatriation, the Oman program. Mm -hmm. You know, the people that are are coming across, and and Gene's right, I mean, and Joanne had mentioned earlier, you know, they were talking a couple thousand and stuff they let up. These people are people who were already registered in this program, and the pro Mm -hmm. they were it was already an ongoing process for them. In a situation like the ethnic Kazakhs have in Xinjiang now, you would imagine logically, uh, if it, they were free to choose, that, that all the Kazakhs would leave Xinjiang, Xinjiang and come to Kazakhstan as soon as they can. I, I don't expect that's going to happen, you know, and we were just talking about the uh-huh. fact that it would be reduced. So, uh, you know, then it just comes down to trying to get whatever information we can out of China about how the Kazakhs are living. Radio Free Asia has done a great job of documenting how they, they were the ones that actually exposed that the ethnic Kazakhs were were being uh, put into these camps along with the Uyghurs, you know, a couple uh-huh. years ago. You know, I, I, it can't be business as usual for them, but I don't expect that the Chinese government is going to let what would really be a flood of Kazakhs back into the country. So in the end, the Kazakh government, <laughs> they're going to look bad on this one way or another. Uh, what they, they got to hope for now is just that there's not another issue that involves China and, and Kazakhstan's relations with China that hits the population the wrong way, because this will be one is something that that they'll just tack on to whatever anti-Chinese sentiment is already out there. Yeah. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce Panier, editor of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Central Asia, Blog, Kishlok, Awazi. <laughs> also, big thanks goes to Giovanna Lelis, Chief Central Asia Correspondent for Euroasia Net, and Jean Bonin, freelance journalist in Kazakhstan. Thank you, colleagues, for your time and thoughts today. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. And this is from me, Mohammed Tahir, host of the Majlis podcast. Until next week. Bye-bye.